The risks of potential sea level rise in Indonesia are absolutely enormous. In fact, they are the highest risks of anywhere in the world. Some recent studies that suggest that uh, Indonesia is 14 times more exposed to sea level rise than we realized previously. And remarkably, Indonesia represents 10% of the land area that's exposed to sea level risk. It's also important to realize Indonesia is not only the most vulnerable globally to sea level rise, but the pace at which that vulnerability will appear is extremely fast. If you consider that a what is currently a one in 100 year flooding event with uh, 10 centimeters of sea level rise becomes a one in 33 year event. And it becomes a one in 11 year event if the sea level rise is 20 centimeters. By 2050, in most places in the world, these ex what are currently one in 100 year extreme events will be annual occurrences, more than one event a year. And in Indonesia, because sea level there is rising at least four times faster than the global average, these one in 100 year events will become annual events far, far sooner. Rising temperatures will do a couple of things. One is collapse coral reef systems, which are the incubators of fish stocks. The second thing is that it will force fish populations to move to colder waters just to survive. Um, so in terms of natural fish stocks, absolutely those will uh, depart the region essentially. This is a huge part of um, the way in which people in the region get their protein. Take that out of the equation, how will they replace that? Um, especially if other sources of, say, plant-based protein, like, for example, soy, um, are also undergoing shortages because of climate change in the region. It's very difficult to buy your way out of your malnutrition and protein problem when food stocks around the world are impacted by climate change. So, of course, the first thing is mitigation. We have to get emissions down. Um, that's, that is the most urgent task of the next 10 years. Unlike almost any country in the world, we are hugely exposed to the hazards climate change is amplifying, hugely exposed domestically, but also we're in a region with many near-neighbor, near less developed countries that are also enormously exposed, literally 400 million people in maritime Southeast Asia alone. So we need to act with far greater ambition. Well, you know, you can swim across to Papua New Guinea at low tide from Australia, and uh, Indonesia is not a lot further away from our shores. So it is impossible to imagine the scale of these hazards that climate change is amplifying unfolding in Indonesia and have those problems be contained within Indonesia's national borders. Those problems will spill over to Australia, whether it's people movement, political instability, the rise of separatist movements, political extremism, terrorism. In terms of political instability, this is a real risk uh, throughout the region. One of the consequences of that is that we might be looking at a lot of increasingly fragile and perhaps failed states in the region. Those um, developments create geopolitical vacuums that great powers can move into. We have to understand what the scale of the impacts are. And currently, it's as if we're sleepwalking or we have this Indonesia blind spot in our foreign policy and our, our general approach to that country. But one thing that we can look at at the moment is the Biden administration. What the Biden administration has done is made climate change central to every signal cabinet level portfolio and essentially through executive orders has mandated that those um, cabinet level portfolios work together in working groups on climate uh, and have come up with some real milestones for achievement. I know in Queensland, our, ha our most hazard prone state, um, where 53 local government areas out of the 77 have now experienced three or more major disasters in the last three years. For some of them, it's four, five, or six. We don't have to explain it to them. 
They understand that climate change is happening. 60% of Australians directly experience the impact of Black Summer, whether it was the fires themselves, the air quality, or other aspects of that emergency. We were very fortunate during Black Summer. We barely managed with the scale of that hazard. Just imagine that crisis on a scale like that unfolding in a country like Indonesia, where there are 275 million people, where there's major um, poverty, uh, where there is already a history of, um, of ethnic tension, of conflict in the past, and where institutions are becoming stronger but still have major, major weaknesses. Those impacts will be absolutely enormous and they will affect us directly. Mm -hmm.